on behalf of uh, Securities Commission Malaysia and the UN Capital Development Fund, we welcome you to the webinar on fintech landscape in Malaysia, uh, Islamic capital markets. Uh, this webinar is part of the Fintech Islamic, uh, FICRA Islamic Fintech Program, which is a joint initiative by uh, Securities Commission Malaysia and the UNCDF uh, to help develop the Islamic capital market in Malaysia. The first engagement under FICRA is aimed at supporting innovative fintech ideas and solutions uh, through a more structured accelerator program. The applications for which are open as we speak and they'll remain open till the 30th of June. Uh, the webinar today is specifically aimed at further understanding the Islamic capital market landscape in Malaysia, along with opportunities for tech interventions. We will have two sessions over the next 60. The first is a panel discussion on Islamic capital markets and be privileged to have a stellar panel of experts uh, with us who will bring in the entire discussion. Uh, the panel session will be followed by uh, a brief Q&A uh, where we will take questions from, from you as well. Uh, the second session of the webinar is a brief presentation on the FICRA program followed again by a Q&A. Uh, it, needless to add that we want to keep both the sessions very interactive and hence encourage all participants to please post all your questions in the Q&A tab, uh, which you would find in the control bar on the Zoom platform. Uh, request all participants to please refrain from posting any promotional or marketing messages in the chat box and keep it restricted to uh, points that would benefit the entire uh, uh, audience. We would also like to inform everybody that the webinar is being recorded uh, and we'll be happy to share this with you subsequent to the webinar as well. Uh, with that uh, brief introduction and, and house rules, uh, we would like to kick off the panel discussion. Uh, please allow me the privilege to introduce your, uh, your panelists. Uh, we uh, actually have um, a fairly diverse mix of, uh, a mix of and you know, uh, just to give you an idea, uh, you know, our idea was to to make sure that we are able to bring in more diverse speakers to to share with you different aspects of Islamic capital markets, uh, so that you are able to understand what sort of opportunities exist in the Malaysian ecosystem, uh, and where some of your solutions might also align. Uh, and uh, one and second also gives you a good idea of uh, what the entire sector has to offer. The sector is looking to grow going forward in in Malaysia. Uh, so with that, uh, you know, we have four, four uh, uh, panelists and uh, uh, a very, a very seasoned and experienced moderator in, in Vinita Tan, who is the red money. Uh, then the first panelist is uh, Mr. Amran Zaki, who is Senior Director, Public Sector and uh, High Net Worth uh, Individual Business at Afin Huang Asset Management. Uh, then we have uh, Ms. Azleen Waris, who is the Chief Financial Officer at Ventures, which is part of the PNB Group. Uh, we have Mr. Iqbal Juso, who's the head Islamic markets at Kananga Investment Bank. Uh, and then, of course, uh, to bring in a good perspective on investment funding, uh, which may be of interest to many of you as well, we have uh, Mr. Jamaluddin Bujang, who's managing director, Gobi Partners, Malaysia. So quite a quite an interesting uh, lineup of speakers. And uh, needless to add that we you know look forward to a fairly engaging discussion. Uh, with that uh, brief context, may I now invite uh, Vinita to kindly open the panel session. Uh, Vinita, over to you, please. Thank you so much, Priyank, and uh, you know, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to um, everyone who has tuned in today. As Priyank has mentioned, if we do, um, we're very fortunate to have such an engaging um, and, and a, a high-level panel today to sort of explore the Islamic capital markets and Islamic fintech landscape in Malaysia. Um, uh, so, you know, we would have about half an hour to 40 minutes for this discussion. And as Priyang has mentioned, uh, we do have an opportunity for Q&A after the session. So please, this panel is for you um, at any time. If you have any questions you'd like um, it to be addressed by any of our expert panelists, um, do feel free to just um, input your questions on the Q&A um, function. 
So without um, uh, without further ado, let us just um, go right into it. Um, I would like to really just start off our discussion by setting a little bit of context. Um, so Iqbal, perhaps I could get you to, to kick us off. Really, when we talk about Islamic capital markets in Malaysia, what, what's the landscape like now? Like, What's the current composition of Islamic instruments in the broader um, capital markets? All right. Uh, thanks, Vinita. Uh, let me begin with stock markets. As at 31st May 2021, uh, we have seen that out of 936 companies listed on Bursa Malaysia, 80% are Shara compliant. Out of 19 exchange traded funds, ETF listed on Bursa, five are Shara compliant. Out of 18 real estate investment trusts, REITs listed on Bursa, four are Shara compliant. In addition, we also have seen four listed ETBS, exchange traded bond and sukuk listed on Bursa, Three were issued by Dana Infra National, meant to finance the MRT project and Pan Borneo Highway. And one, Ihsan Sukuk, sponsored by Khazana National, meant to finance the Trust Schools program. On the debt capital market sites, we also have seen uh, total Islamic bonds or Sukuk outstanding for government and corporates as set December 2020 was 1.07 trillion ringgit which is around 67% of the total combined number of uh, bonds and sukuk outstanding for government and corporates stood at 1.6 trillion ringgit. Out of this number, we have total corporate sukuk outstanding as at December 2020 stood at 493 billion ringgit. Specific on equity instrument listed on Bursa, in addition to the uh, stocks, we also seen other some instruments being listed on Bursa be it a company warren that track the performance of the mother shares, uh, Islamic redeemable preference shares. We also have instruments like Arquits, which is redeemable, comfortable, unsecured Islamic debt securities, which is the Shara compliant version of the conventional loan stocks. On the debt capital market sites, uh, we've seen um, issuers doing SRI sukuk, social, uh, sustainable and uh, responsible investment sukuk, where government give in incentive for the issuers. If they issue a SRI sukuk, regardless of their sukuk structure, they will get tax deductible on their issuance costs. Adding vibrancy to this capital market, we also seen uh, Security Commission giving license to three DEX, Digital Asset Exchange, which allows investors to trade digital currency and digital tokens on their exchanges. And soon, uh, we believe uh, Security Commission will provide avenues for startups to also uh, do their funding uh, activities via initial exchange offering. And in addition to that, we also have a number of uh, P2P, peer-to-peer -peer lending platform, as well as equity funding platform. Uh, doing their fundraising activities with uh, investors uh, have the opportunity uh, to also have access to their Islamic investment notes or Islamic equity crowdfunding as well. Vinita, you're on mute, I think. Ah, sorry. Um, so as Iqbal, you've, you've painted a picture of how really uh, we do have a very advanced Islamic capital uh, market. Um, I'm wondering if I could get you to chime in really to give the perspective on the sort of like current state of play um, specific towards Islamic fund management. Hi, sure. Um, be happy to. Um, can, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. All right. Uh, thank you, Vinita. Uh, thank you, Iqbal, for setting the context. So I think I'll just focus on, uh, I think as, as per your question on fund management. Yeah? I think uh, maybe allow me to just uh, read a little bit of a passage here. I think according to IFSB, Islamic Financial Services Industry Stability Report 2020, Saudi Arabia and Malaysia retains the top two jurisdiction for Islamic funds by domicile, accounting for two thirds of the total global Islamic AUM as it end 2019. Uh, but if we focus uh, specifically on Malaysia, 
Uh, Malaysia's leadership in Islamic fund management is basically rooted on the country's comprehensive regulatory, sharia and legal framework, providing an enabling ecosystem for fund managers to attract domestic and foreign flows into the country. Um, if you mentioned about Malaysia, I think we have a deep pool of professional investment managers here in Malaysia. It ranges from uh, 31 fund management companies with Islamic windows, 23 Islamic fund management companies, and I think the recent entrance is the seven digital investment managers yeah, to offer a wide range of funds to cater for investor requirements. Um, Maybe if I can just touch a bit on the traditional fund managers and digital fund managers, yeah? uh, Vinita. Uh, yes, there is an overlap in terms of retail market coverage, right? but I think the market is large enough to cater for all the players. If you look at uh, the end of December 2020, Islamic AUM grew by 20%. Uh, that accounts for about 217 billion. This is based on SC annual report uh, 2020. And we really believe that this is a healthy development, uh, providing options for the public at large. Um, because if you look at it, um, we have uh, younger investors and B40 segments yeah, coming into the, into the market space. Uh, if you look at in terms that their ticket size may be smaller, yeah, but having the digital investment managers uh, in, in this space actually can provide them that, uh, uh, that option for them to invest. And we can also look at it as uh, uh, expanding in terms of financial inclusion, yeah? getting more, more investors in the market. Uh, if, we, if I can just uh, uh, use us as an example at Afin Huang Asset Management, we are basically known as the traditional fund manager, but we are also participating in this digital space. Uh, via our online and mobile platforms. Our Allocate Plus app allows investors to invest into a suite of our Sharia conventional funds. And our partnership with uh, Versa provides digital cash management platform for investors to earn returns on money market yeah, uh, with investments as low as one ringgit. So I think it's, uh, it's a healthy development uh, in the fund management space. Yeah? Thanks, Vinta. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Amran. Um, yes, it is indeed uh, a healthy development. As you've mentioned, the market, the pie is big enough for everyone. Um, Azlin, so, you know, Amran has sort of um, provided this segue of how there's this emergence of di digital technology being incorporated into the fund management landscape. Um, I, was, I was wondering if you could perhaps expand on that, on like, what kind of tech solutions are we seeing um, within Islamic capital markets? So what kind of solutions do you think um, the market needs? Thanks, Vidita. Uh, so the Islamic fintech uh, verticals are vast and compensing. Uh, at the moment now, we have tech, IT, infrastructure. We have peer-to-peer -peer lending, uh, equity crowdfunding. We've got data analytics. We've got the blockchain, robot advisors, uh, the emerging digital banks, Taka Tech, uh, in short, for Takapu technology, payment remittance and effects. Um, yeah, I'd like to read some of the excerpts from Global Fintech Report in 2019 by PwC, and it states that financial institutions, 48% uh, 40, of them have embedded fintech fully into their strategic operating model. Uh, and out of this 40% financial institutions, 30% of them have incorporated emerging technologies into the products and services they sell. So coming back to Malaysia, Malaysia has become a prominent financial uh, fintech player uh, with 21 Islamic fintech providers out of 161 globally as per March 2021 report by Islamic Fintech Network Landscape. And out of which for Malaysia, we have already four Malaysian-based platform currently in the capital market services and they are serving equity crowdfunding, peer-to-peer -peer lending and digital investment management. Uh, so... For Malaysia, it is expected that Islamic fintech within the Malaysian capital market will increase and the market space is set to grow. Um, as mentioned by uh, Iqbal and Amran uh, earlier, uh, we do have, um, given the COVID situation, uh, fintech is playing a huge, huge part uh, in terms of capping uh, capital 
uh, in bridging capital to SMEs, for example, right? But there are also uh, fintech solutions that actual users uh, need. For example, now 30% of Malaysians are all gig workers. So we have found in our, um, in our research that um, this 30% uh, gig workers are basically uh, not from the mainstream segment. Uh, they are uh, not being served by the, the FIs. And, uh, and the financial solutions or financial fintech providers are working directly with uh, financial institutions to actually bridge this gap by introducing micro services and micro loans. And you see that happening already with FIs uh, uh, collaborating with fintechs and fintech companies. All right, thank you so much, Azlin. Um, Jamal, would you agree with what Azlin has shared so far uh, that we are seeing um, this more collaboration between fintech as well as um, FIs, but also because of your global experience as uh, investors, you work closely with, with the startup community as well. Um, you, I'm curious to know what sort of capital market tech solutions are you observing here as well as globally, um, which you think could be applied to the Islamic capital market space? Um, you hear me? Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Vita. And uh, thank you, everyone, before this. Um, now, I, you know, I just face this all the time when people asking about Islamic fintech, Islamic capital markets and all that. But I always see this, all this as a product. Uh, when we talk about, about, about tech, it's actually it's just a tool. Uh, to deliver these products to their users, right? Um, so I cannot see, well, maybe some people do, um, uh, between Islamic and non-Islamic part of it. it. To me, it's just two. What the, the difference is you serving which market, uh, right? Or your target market. But even then, it's always intangible. You, you know, you, you serve Muslim market, that means you can also serve non-Muslim. And in fact, I mean, some of the, you know, like Islamic, products, loan products, as well, which subscribed by non-Muslims as well. Now, coming back to your question earlier on the, on the technology that can be, be applied here uh, using, uh, you know, relying from uh, from outside Malaysia, for example, right? I, I think to begin with, nation entrepreneurs, I think you have to, you have to, you know, if you want to, 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 to capture the market, right? It's, uh, if you just want to focus on just purely Muslim as your market, uh, that's definitely, I as well know, it's halal food, right? So it starts from manufacturing, you know, this distribution, uh, you know, and in, in between all the transaction, digital or not, and all that. And of course, it's tra uh, tracing of that halal uh, supply chain. So that's a big market. And we know this is going very, very fast. So that's definitely helps to, you know, the halal on the, on the, on the food manufacturing side. Secondly, uh, some part of education as well. Uh, Muslim, especially, uh, you know, uh, kids' education. I so far I haven't seen any big, well, I haven't seen any specific educational tools just focusing on uh, Muslim on the Muslim market. Uh, the other thing, of course, travel. Travel in the, especially in Umrah and Hajj market. That's a big, big market. Uh, in fact, Gobi we invested in one company uh, focusing on that. Uh, the company has been very, doing very, very well until, of course, COVID hit. But we think this kind of rebound. Uh, very fast after after the MCO is over. Again, that's just focusing on just serving Muslim market. The other thing is um, uh, uh, asset management side. I think as you mentioned earlier, uh, uh, you know, just focusing on on wealth management, uh, specifically specifically focusing on Muslim market. Um, and of course, that's like uh, you know, as Muslim, we we donate. Uh, uh, you know, a lot uh, or re regularly. So again, I think if, if ever you can create a platform to make it easy for people to donate, for example, or pay, pay their, what do you call it? Uh, uh, um, what do you call it? A zakat, for example. Make it easier for people. Then definitely a big market. 
you know, I think I'm sure one of you, some of you have come across where, you know, suddenly you want to, to make a donation for that day, suddenly you couldn't, you cannot think of what to do, where, where, where to pay, how to transfer the money and all that, right? So I think that would be a big market. Um, and also, I've also, yeah, I have come across uh, this company that's trying to offer, I would say something like, uh, you know, Nirvana, you know, Nirvana, the listed company, right? Uh, it provide all this, something got to do with that solution. Uh, so this one is just a Muslim version of it. Uh, together with um, uh, estate management uh, and stuff like that. So again, so these are just uh, very specific Muslim market um, that you know entrepreneurs can start to, 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 to focus on. Look, uh, the market is wide open. I mean, we don't even have to, to import uh, technologies or, companies that provide that services from overseas, we can create it here. Uh, it's, a, it's a big market. It's had, you know, it has to really make, we have to really, have to make a big impact uh, yet, uh, you know, uh, in terms of this technology here. Yeah. Mm, absolutely. So um, I, I like what you've shared because you've obviously highlighted certain opportunities there are for tech entrepreneurs yeah. uh, focusing on the yeah. Muslim market. But at the same time, also, you've also highlighted some of the challenges. For example, you talk about zakat uh, payment facilitation, um, yeah. which is not always as simple as you like to be um, here. So building that, uh, on that, um, I, you know, either Iqbal or Amran, if I could get your, your input on really, like we've talked about how the Malaysian Islamic capital markets, like it's so advanced. It is one of the most advanced in the world. We've looked at, you know, um, how long we've come, uh, how far we've come. Um, but could you guys perhaps shed some light on um, on key or or uh, persistent gaps or challenges that the market face? Yeah, uh, Vinita, okay, allow me to just to chip in. Uh, again, this backdrop, last year, for example, uh, uh, with the lockdown uh, amid COVID-19 pandemic, uh, uh, we have seen at Bursa that there's a record numbers of retail investors' participation, actually. And uh, total net purchase by retail investors amounted to 14.3 billion ringgit for the year. While their uh, retail average daily value, ADV, traded hit a record 1.6 billion, a 235% increase from 473 million in 2019. So while this uh, increasing participation among younger investors, uh, we have also seen a CDS account open with Brosa uh, from the people aging between 26 to 45 years old. Uh, while the opportunities in the Islamic capital markets investment sounds like uh, low hanging fruits, I think we at least need to address five gaps that I can think of. Number one is the need to improve the financial inclusion for other mass retail segments. Uh, what about those aging between 18 to 25 years old, those currently studying in high colleges and universities? How active are they in, in trading activities? Were they uh, in their young investors club established in this, those universities? What about people at the peak of their careers between 46 to 50, 55 years old? And what about those who are flush with cash upon being able to withdraw their monies with the EPF? So we need to have uh, uh, further improvement on financial inclusion within this segment as well. That's number one. Gap number two, I think, is the need to bridge the financial literacy between the bottom 40, middle 40, and top 20 income group within the community. We need to transform the majority people's thinking from typical pure consumer mindset to a shareholder investor mindset from always being indulged with instant gratification to a delayed gratification with financial freedom as their ultimate goal. We also need to bridge the digital divide between the rural and the urban communities. Of course, we know that government is doing very hard you know, with their uh, government agency like MCMC tries to, to plan and execute national fiberization and connectivity plan. We've estimated with 1.6 billion to spend to improve connectivity. So I think there's a lot of opportunities here within this gap. And gap number three that I can think of is the need to have just a simple app that speaks the language of the common people, predominantly in Basel, Malaysia. And that's in the, that will be an app that everyone must have access to. The app that they can understand their consumption and spending behavior 
their saving behavior, their risk profiling. If a pop-up notification on the importance of saving for rainy days and investing for wealth creation and constantly being reminded of their financial goal. Gap number four, I think we need to have many more platforms that offer a plenty of investment opportunities that conform to the Shana requirement with attractive yields and integrate with the social finance agenda. And I think this thing we can elaborate further in the next round. And lastly, I think it's time for us to introduce a new ecosystem, perhaps a platform that allows democratization of stock investment, perhaps a platform that allows people to purchase one share per transaction. Maybe we can start with the top 30 largest uh, market cap blue chip stock listed on FDM KLCI or FDM Hydra Sharia Index. It's something that uh, fintech players should think of. Thanks, Vinita. Thanks, Iqbal Amran. Yes, if I can chime in a bit, I think it's well covered by Iqbal. Perhaps I just cover on in terms of where we see uh, there is a gap in the capital market, Islamic capital market. Um, not just Islamic capital market, also the, the capital market in, in a whole. I think we are moving towards uh, digital, digitalization at the moment, right? So in, in, in our opinion, a seamless client onboarding process and experience is a must, it's a required. We see. Uh, allow me to also touch a bit on our on the tech the tech uh, aspect a bit. I think we see a significant opportunity in regulation technology or reg tech. Yeah, we feel that an advancement in regulation technology or reg tech will strengthen Islamic proposition, as the client onboarding process is the first touch point for potential investors. I think uh, Ibal mentioned it earlier in terms of the various market segments, right? Um, that we want to we want to attract. But having that first touch point is key. Um, why? Because we want to ensure a seamless experience uh, for, the, for the investor to participate in the Islamic capital market. And RegTech uh, also provides opportunity to drive proliferation of new products. Because uh, with the regulation technology, uh, the fund manager can focus on managing uh, or creating funds, while the regulation technology can ensure compliance and uh, make sure that the fund managers are no longer uh, unencumbered, basically. Yeah? Uh, so they can, they can do their job managing the funds, but at least on the regulatory aspect, it's covered. Yeah. I think that's just my uh, uh, two Thank you so much, Amran. Um, and, and you, you highlighted a good point about um, RegTech. Um, so Azlin, um, considering the challenges that have been um, brought up by our colleagues, um, in, in your opinion, like what kind of role does technology play in addressing such gaps? Obviously, Amram mentioned a bit about um, RegTech. What else um, can we look forward to? So um, in essence, digital and innovation has been there for many years already and before COVID. But COVID basically accelerated it, right? And, um, and before, um, all these digital tools has already been there, digital products has already been there, we have all that, and we have all the infrastructure. Um, but COVID-19, the pandemic has really prioritized uh, digital transformation, and it's really towards economy and social reform. And we see now the organization needs to embrace data-driven digital decision-making and move from product push to customer pool. And we experienced that in PNB. We can take PNB as a use case, right? So uh, in a typical uh, fintech uh, transformation, uh, in particular um, Islamic, uh, we see first how do, how do companies actually pivot uh, given, the, given the, the situation at this point in time. It's really simplified account opening of EKYC, like what Amran uh, mentioned earlier, right? Along with AML process of a digital ID which is very crucial. And secondly, is being used of uh, being, being, um, having used the digital payment system, which we already have. And third is the emerging all these new innovation uh, tools, AI, data, and uh, blockchain, blockchain uh, which is still in the, uh, in the early stage, right? Um, and, and fourth, as we see now, governments are really uh, delivering all the services to achieve financial inclusion. And, and, and as for Islamic fintech, uh, it's really consolidating, consolidating all of this and ensuring that the Sharia compliance bit is actually um, fulfilled to ensure sustainable uh, development of Islamic finance, right? So 
finance uh, some finance finance world uh, now is exposed uh, to turn to or exposed to open innovation uh, to provide speedy uh, timely reliable and sustainable solution and uh, and crisis uh, crisis like what we are uh, undergoing now the pandemic and you know emergency situations allow open innovation and uh, open innovation to happen uh, so case in point to pnb so pnb has uh, taken digital transformation plan since 2018, since, since before COVID-19. Uh, uh, but the pandemic has uh, disconnected us to our customers. Uh, and in our industry, it is all about servicing and engagement. Uh, our customers come to our branch, they come to the agent branches to be serviced. Uh, but we have introduced the digital um, channels uh, with the portal that we have now, MySMB portal, and we also have the MySMB app. Right. Uh, so, with the uh, pandemic, we have um, uh, we have taken quick measures to pivot uh, with innovative digital products uh, slated to be released this year. And amongst our immediate initiative is um, EKYC, which is uh, uh, mobile onboarding, uh, digital onboarding of all our customers. And um, other than transactional. Uh, activities with our investors, we are also introducing goal-based investing. It's really towards financial inclusion, towards financial literacy, like how Iqbal was mentioning earlier, right? Uh, so all these new features will be um, embedded uh, as an enhancement onto our MySMB app. And we believe, PNB believes that uh, reducing barriers to entry and investment, investing for all Malaysians is, is something that technology can easily facilitate. Uh, so, uh, built by PMB's technology division and dual digital ventures, JDB, uh, the enhancements seek to facilitate seamless and convenient investing for all Malaysians in light of the restriction in uh, movements. Uh, so, what the what would be the EKYC does? Uh, what would be the mobile on what it does is the the EKYC will enable non ASMB unit holders to open account via MySMB app uh, right. without having to visit uh, our mm -hmm. branches, our agent branches. Uh, likewise, uh, the existing MySMB users uh, will no longer to visit our branches or agent branches as well. Uh, they will just need to log on to the portal and MySMB app um, and even update their, their details such as, for example, a phone number. And all these processes are being completed instantly uh, within the app. Um, having been in the industry for more than 40 years, um, ASB, PNB, is proud to play a key role in the lives of Malaysians seeking to protect and grow their wealth. Um, not just their wealth, but it's also um, the next generations or future gen generation. And these features within our MySMB app is the practical next step for us to reach even more Malaysians. Um, and it's all about customer experience, customer, customer, uh, service, customer satisfaction, it's all customer centric. Uh, so th that is how basically technology and the goal of technology facilitates, especially in our, in our industry. Absolutely, um, this shift to a customer centric model. I also, I read somewhere that the, um, the pandemic has re is, is perhaps like the world's most effective um, chief um, transformation officer, <laughs> chief digital officer, having catalyzed so much digital transformation within a relatively short period of time. And we are seeing this with PNB, even with um, Afin Huang. Um, so before we, I, I, I appreciate that we are running out of time. Um, so I would like to just uh, quickly just uh, go through the points that, that we would like to discover today. Um, and before we circle back to some of the points that, you know, Iqbal and Ra has mentioned earlier on in terms of opportunities. Jamal, if I could really quickly go to you um, to sort of um, talk a little bit about the um, funding landscape for Islamic Islamic fintech startups, because this is a perennial challenge for any startups anywhere. Um, I'd like to understand what, what's the landscape like for Malaysian um, startups and, and Islamic startups, or in how really we can address this gap. Uh, it's, always, it's always a problem. Uh, 
as far as I've been, since I've been around in this line, it's always been a problem. Nobody has stopped talking about it, whether you're at the private level or the, the, at the private uh, public sector level. No, it's very simple. Um, uh, is you know, I come from VC, right? Now, VC is a manager, right? Um, now, we are we're managing. We are, we, are, we are managing the, the money of our LPs and channel that to the, the rightful or the most deserving startup companies. Now, I think a lot of people are not aware that out of 100 that who comes to us seeking for VC funding, right? Uh, the one that you get funded is actually losing the one to 2% of it. You know? One to 2%. I think internationally, the number is actually one every 200. In Malaysia, large calculation is about one and a half to two. So actually, the, in terms of getting money, uh, VC money for, for, for founders here in Malaysia, it's just better. I think three times better, up to four times better than, than, than internationally, uh, at the international level. Um, now, we're talking about the two people who got money, right? And what happened to the 98 people who didn't get money? So there's all these, these are the people, there are not the people, but these are the, 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 the public will see that, oh, hey, wait a minute, how come 98 people don't get money? Uh, and the people, the, the two who got, they never tell like, people that they get money anyway in the first place. So there's always uh, a, a question of, you know, there's not enough money uh, uh, being circulated uh, around to, uh, to, to, to start companies. But VC money is only for companies that's the most deserving companies that, that VC is in. Now, it doesn't mean that 98 businesses are not good. They're good, but they can get funded by other sources. Um, in fact, out of the 98, right? Easily half of them get funded and the company will survive. In fact, can come even better than the company got funded by VCs anyway. Um, so they are, I think, focusing on other sources of capital for that balance and is also just as important. Um, so that's something. Uh, now, talking about VC itself, where we get money, because we, we, we raise money from, from, from limited margins, right? Um, and on their side, we have companies uh, identified to, to channel the money to. The source money has to be there. So where I source this money? Because if there's no source of money now, I'm not, I won't be able to raise money from you know, LPs, then I can fund the money to, to, get, you know, to the founders. So again, that's a problem that you know, has, to be, has, has to be resolved. But having said that, I think the government has done, has done quite well. I think if you look at the, the recent Penjana uh, uh, program and they have what they have uh, issued like 600 million uh, fund to six or eight companies they can do the same thing for to encourage Islamic uh, VC right they can do the same thing uh, I'm sure they can um, so again that's 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 how I see it all right thank you so much okay so um, uh, my next question really also ties in with um, a, a question we got from our audience, which was on further comments on financial inclusion and Islamic financial services. So because one of them, um, and we see this really sort of like becoming more prominent is the digitization of Islamic social finance instruments. We're talking about like Zakat, Waka. Um, so um, Amran, perhaps I could get you um, to chime in now, like, um, you know, uh, the integration of social finance instruments like that has, it, it is one has long been advocated for. Are we really seeing this materialize in the ICM space? And, you know, can this work? And if so, how will it look like? Yeah, I, th I think there is a, an increase, increasing convergence right now between Sharia and ESG principles. The alignment basically of, of these both principles will appeal to a broader base of investors, I think, like what Jamal was alluding earlier. And this will actually help catalyze both the capital market and the Islamic capital market side. Um, I think in terms of uh, social finance or social agenda, I think from the fund management point of view, there is uh, what we call a Sharia fund with waka features. Yeah? So I think that um, it basically entails that the fund manager manages the fund and actually appoint a wakaf administrator. Uh, this wakaf administrator is responsible to manage and distribute the wakaf asset to the underprivileged and deserving community. Uh, how it works is normally there's a percentage uh, agreed up front yeah, uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the prospectus. Yeah? Uh, so in the prospectus, it will mention that, uh, let's say, I think we have about 
if I'm not mistaken, about four to five uh, Waka funds now available in, in Malaysia. Yeah. So each uh, Waka fund will predetermine in terms of uh, income distribution uh, that they will set aside uh, for the Waka asset. Yeah. So that's on the Waka fund. But we also have a, uh, another fund that focuses on the Sakat features. Yeah. Uh, as you know, Muslim investors are required to purify their investments. And they have to pay a zakat investment of 2.5 percent. Yeah, so by investing in uh, Sharia funds with zakat features, um, the fund managers take that responsibility off uh, for the investor. Yeah, uh, if I can just mention on on how we do it on our side, our Islamic fund management company Aiman. Uh, currently, we have about 12 Sharia funds, suite of uh, Sharia funds, uh, eligible for zakat payment. And what we have done, we have uh, partnered and appointed Lembaga Zakat Selangor as the Zakat Management Agency. So any Zakat payment contribution will be channeled to uh, Lembaga Zakat Selangor. And I think uh, both the Wakaf and the, and the Sharia features, actually, it's more of a social finance yeah, to help the less fortunate. Yeah? And I, I think it's, it's, a, uh, it's the right step uh, uh, for us to move forward. Thanks, Amran. Ibal, do you have anything to add? Yeah, uh, adding uh, to the points uh, highlighted by Amran just now, I think uh, it's also timely for some digital solutions should be available out there in the market uh, with embedded uh, zakat advice and calculator, for example, right? So when, when you invest, and, and it's also there are features in the apps that allows the users to calculate how much is the, the zakat amount that are due to them to pay to distribute to the uh, beneficiaries. In, in, in uh, Islamic teaching, we have this terminology, we call it nisab, which is the minimum amount that uh, a Muslim need to uh, uh, have before they are obliged to pay the zakat, as well as uh, the how. How is the, the uh, uh, minimum tenure? Uh, normally, it's one year period where uh, when they attain certain amount of wealth that they need to do a donation to the uh, beneficiaries. So these features must be embedded in the digital solution as well. Uh, in addition, maybe uh, outside from the zakat or uh, uh, finance agenda, we also can look through uh, uh, in terms of uh, the SRI agenda as well. We need to have a solution or uh, uh, investing platform that specialize uh, to uh, allow easy access, easy identification for users to identify uh, business with sustainable business agenda, for example, plantation companies with MSPO certification. Okay, uh, for example, listed companies that are currently on the FTSE for Good Busa Malaysia Shara Index, and uh, companies that issues SRI Suku. So this need to be easily identif uh, identifiable for uh, retail investors. Okay, so this is, I think, uh, some ideas that um, fintech players should. Think of. Thank you much, um, Priyank, I was wondering if we have um, perhaps five more minutes or do we need to wrap up already? Uh, maybe a couple of more minutes, then we can uh, keep some yeah. time for so just one, questions as well. Yeah, just one final um, uh, question really to, to Azlin and Jamal. So um, uh, we have, you know, the last like half an hour, we've talked about um, capital markets and, you know, startups and things like that. Really, then um, we are curious to know what really are the components needed to nurture the Islamic fintech startup community here in Malaysia. And in your in, in your opinion, you know, as Lina Jamal, like based on our discussion so far, is Malaysia uh, primed to be an Islamic fintech destination? Um, for, you know, ICM solutions or Islamic finance solutions. Um, so, I was who wants to start? Go on, I'll, I'll start first here, Jamal. Thank you, Benita. Go ahead, so go basically, ahead. You can take anything. Yeah. <laughs> right, so basically, uh, JDB is in the position of uh, an investor. We're also a builder. So we're basically a fintech startup as well. Um, so what we do is uh, we ensure that um, basically the, the fintech ecosystem would have to be startup and you would have uh, your, your, your standards, right? Developers, you have the governments as well, your customers, you know who your customers are, um, and the regulators in our, on, on our capacity because our products are actually capital market products, they're reg regulated, right? And um, for a Sharia fintech, uh, the role of uh, the board of Sharia is actually as important. 
but uh, the role of business partnership between a fintech and a technology company is as, as, as crucial as well. Case in point, um, GDB holds an investment in a, in a fintech startup called Race Malaysia. Uh, so how, what, the, what is the function of an investor with the fintech company as well and how it aligns to the PNB's long-term strategy plan is we incubate, so we, uh, we help them to sustain and ensure uh, that uh, basically they will uh, uh, grow over the years and how uh, it depends on basically the sponsorship and, and, and the working arrangement with this business partner where uh, the part, the both sides will actually, uh, uh, they will basically uh, play off each other's strength, right? For, for example, if um, financial services uh, allows FinTech to actually uh, um, go through via a JV or, or basically mergers and acquisition, then it allows uh, each sector needs to be, um, you basically learn from each other, right? So in a way that you upskill. So what we, we learn from, from this whole experience is uh, from, from the investment in race, for example, uh, by, by, uh, by having uh, such um, partnership, we also um, discover a new uh, business revenue stream for PNB where we are targeting the youth segment, and also um, the, the, the youth segment or our customers allow, are allowed to actually experience uh, new diversified products as compared to uh, what they are experiencing now in ESMB. So I would feel that uh, the key components would be um, the alignment in terms of uh, how, what is the role of your FinTech um, and partnership uh, between a FinTech company and also an FI, for example. Thanks, Chama. Do you have anything to add before we go to the questions? Uh, I think she's answered most of it. I just want to, you know, if you want to know uh, whether Malaysia can become a center. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, if there's no reason. There's, we are, you are quite advanced when it comes to that, right? And the best thing is we have, uh, we are not big, but we have, our market is quite, quite sophisticated already. Right, but we have to be careful because our neighbors, I mean, Indonesia, we put more than 200 million people. Um, that is a big market, and a lot of things can happen there. Uh, I've talked to even uh, some people there, and they are really into this now. So, I think if you are not, you know, if you're not, you know, if you're taking it slowly here, I think we may lose that opportunity. We are already doing very well, you know, in terms of Sukuk and all that, we're the best in the world, but we may lose out even that including the uh, funding for private, uh, you know, private funding. Mm -hmm. Speaking about our regional peers, like I just want to go to, uh, to, to a question, the amount of attendees. Basically the question is, is it sufficient to focus only in the Malaysian market? Like, is it scalable enough in comparison to Indonesia and Singapore? And do we need a plan to go regional? And if so, what's a, what are the main challenges um, a startup would face? The questions too? <laughs> uh, maybe perhaps, Jamal, you oh. could. Yeah. Oh, uh, what was the question again? Sorry, the so really about um, whether is it enough to just focus on the Malaysian market? Oh, I see. Okay, okay. To scale yeah. up, yeah. what are the challenges that a startup would face to like you know scale right, up? Right, right. Mm -hmm. No, I, I think Malaysia is probably the best ground to 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 start up. Uh, we have a population thirty million just big enough for you to, to, to launch a product. Uh, if it's acceptable, widely acceptable by the market, chances are it will be acceptable outside, which is a bigger market, right? Uh, so again, we have all the ingredients that are relatively good uh, communication, transport, and all that. Uh, so Malaysia is the best place to start with. And then the government is very pro-business. So, you know, uh, the market is sophisticated, the users are sophisticated. You know, so yeah, but definitely you have to go out because 30 million population is not big. Okay, you have to go absolutely. out. So, the, the next question, um, I think we have time for more question now. Is Islamic fintech considered to be a separate vertical by itself, or can't ex existing for fintech vertical just show that they are share compliant? Hence, um, really just enlarging the market coverage. Why do we need to segregate Islamic banking when a fintech services is on the vertical example, um, P2P? Um, is there anyone who would like to address that? 
Well, I'll just say this one first. Uh, like I said, I, I said earlier, you know, there shouldn't be any differentiation. The, 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 you know, it's on the market that you want to serve. You know, you want to target a young Muslim market in, uh, in terms of education or wealth formation or that would be it. But, you know, you shouldn't, because your market is everyone. Um, again, tech is just a tool. Yeah, uh, maybe good, maybe it works in terms of uh, branding, yeah, but yeah. that's about it. Yeah. Go on, Nazarene. Yeah. I would agree with uh, GP as well. Uh, it's it's really uh, it's it's basically serves the same purpose. It's just that uh, Islamic fintech is uh, has got to abide to the Sharia principles. But basically, in essence, it's 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 still the same. And 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 Malaysia would be uh, question on Malaysia will Malaysia be the center for for the best fintech financial hub? Yes, because um, we've got robust uh, fintech financial uh, reg 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 regulatory environment um, about OSC it's, and DNM is, is, is really pushing for this and we've got the digital affinity within Malaysians for, for FinTech, Summit FinTech as well. Uh, we've got very strong finance community and also very support, strong government push uh, for, for, uh, for Malaysia to be the global Summit FinTech hub. All right, great. Thank you. Unfortunately, we are, we only have time for these. Uh, I, I we have um, like a whole lot of other questions, but we can't answer them all. Um, but I really appreciate um the questions from 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 the attendees. Uh, I'm sure our panelists, even after uh, today's session, would be available to answer any questions um offline, either through email or if you could like, reach them out through their LinkedIn um or whatever platform. Sure. Um, you know, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank so much. You know, Amran, Iqbal, Jamal, Azlin for really spending the time and sharing your input. It's been most enlightening. Um, thank you so much. And uh, Priyang, if I could just pass the floor over to you. Yes, thank, uh, you, thank you so much, uh, Vinita, you. Uh, for that lovely interaction. And I would also like to thank all the panelists for that interesting uh, discussion. Uh, thank you for your time.